Welcome back to the Place We Find Ourselves podcast. I'm Adam Young, and my guest today is Susan Cunningham, who also goes by Sue. She is a therapist and spiritual director who lives in California. Today, Sue shares one of the most formative stories of her life. It's a story about a first grade girl who decided to use her voice. Your voice is one of the parts of you that is most frequently targeted by evil, and such has certainly been the case for Susan. Thank you for listening to my conversation with Susan Cunningham. Here we go. All right, I have Sue Cunningham with me. Sue, it's good to see you. Thanks. Great to see you, too. Tell uh, our listeners a little bit about you and where you are geographically. I am in the Central Valley of California. I am a counselor, psychotherapist, life and soul coach, and a spiritual director. So let's talk a little bit about your story. When did you learn that you even had a story? What what was your kind of entrance into this journey? I have always known I have a story. I always knew that I was part of people who had a story um, that was very dramatic and very powerful. What I didn't know is that my story mattered or if my story was interesting enough or important enough. And tell us a little bit about your ethnicity, your culture, your heritage. So I'm Armenian American, which means that my grandparents were immigrated to this country, all four of them. They all four have very dramatic stories. And I always used to think that you could make a movie out of almost any one of their stories. And for a time, I felt a real responsibility, like I was here to tell their story. To think that I would tell my own story was was a new thought. I do want to say Armenian. I want to say it really clearly because a lot of people in different places um, get it confused with Armenian, and it, which is a theological perspective. But Armenian is a people from Armenia, or from Turkey, the Middle East. And when you say that your all four of your grandparents have a dramatic story, they fled a massacre. Yes, at, at different times. Like my one of my grandfathers came beforehand because before the the massacre actually occurred, um, there were different writing on the wall that things were dangerous and people were getting killed before it became like the full blown massacre in 1915. So in 1912, my grandfather, my mother's father came. Then later on, my other grandfather came. And then my grandmother, my mother's mother, the one who I was the closest to, she came last. Yeah. And when we say massacre, really, the word is genocide. The Armenian genocide of 19, I think, 12 to 17, 15 to 17 and there is actually the second most studied genocide after the Holocaust. So th- this is a this was a massive uh, attempt to exterminate a people group and your four grandparents escaped that attempt to exterminate their people group. When I was growing up we just called it the massacres, but then it became the genocide and the Armenian genocide and that's why there's always been like a lot of kindred this in the story of the Holocaust, because I could always know that there was another story similar to my story on a way bigger scale. But you may know that Hitler referenced the Armenians and said, who, who now speaks of the Armenians? Like nobody does. So that sort of gave him his own permission. And the bottom line is that what you're putting words to is you came literally from trauma. Mm hmm. You were born into profound levels of of generational trauma. Now, I wouldn't have been able to name that. I mean, it's just the research has come out, you know, lately, the last 20 or however many years, it's just blowing up. So I knew that without knowing it. Sometimes I would even say, like, I couldn't even have, have claimed that that was my trauma because of what they went through. But when I found out about it later, when I read some of the research and did the did some reading and I heard people doing interviews and talking about it, it just explained so much. It felt like, oh, this is both so heavy and also such a relief. 
and say a bit about the relief. Well, it was like, yes, what you have experienced is there's actually a name for it. There, it's, it's a thing. It exists. And for our listeners, if you want more about intergenerational transmission of trauma, you can read Rachel Yehuda, Y-E-H-U-D-A, or you can read a book that I'm currently reading called My Grandmother's Hands by Resma Menicum. Both Rachel and Resma's work outlines how trauma is stored in the body and it's passed down from generation to generation in our bodies. And such was the case for you, Sue, as you're going to read a story of yourself in first grade, but that little first grade girl, without knowing it, carried something of the trauma of her grandparents fleeing a genocide in her little body. So you said you always knew that you had a story and a a dramatic story. You knew from where you came. But when did you start to consider like Sue's story as a story worth telling? Mm. You know, those are two really different things. Me considering my story, like I've always considered my story because I'm someone who is just very interested in story, but I'm also very interested in my own sort of internal world and my internal life. I'm very curious about myself, my personality, what makes me tick. But the thought about my story being something that someone else would be interested in or that I could speak about, that's been pretty recent. When I was doing graduate work in a counseling program is when I began to um, have a lot of awareness that my story is important. And And when it's spoken, like people, they can see some of themselves even in my story. And so as you began to engage Sue's story in a different way, your story in a different way, like uh, more personally, what were some of the obstacles that kind of got in the way of movement in that process? One of the things that got in the way is just the thought of, it's, it's going to sound strange, but like, um, is it important enough? It's not very dramatic. You know, when you, when you, when I have these grandparents with all these like massive stories and then my little story just seems like it's, it certainly isn't like something that anyone would want to make a movie about. The other obstacle is just, um, I have struggled with being seen. So there is a part of me that has wanted to remain just kind of in the background. Focusing on me, taking time for me, taking time to, you know, expound on what I might want to say. Like I was much happier listening to other people and drawing them out than actually speaking myself. And that question of, is my story important enough? I think many people can relate to it. But for you, there was this added emphasis of, I didn't have to flee a genocide. Therefore, compared to my grandparents, I I, I don't have a story. There's no drama that can match that level of drama. How did you overcome, if you will, that sense of my story is not that important? How did you, because you're a woman who takes your story seriously now, and you know it's worth telling, and you know that it has weight, but you didn't always, because you were kind of stuck comparing yourself to your grandparents' stories. How did you come to give your story weight? Well, I think that as I began to grow in terms of telling the truth to myself, to my family, to people who were interested in me, I began to see that like God was doing something in me and through my story. When I began to connect with what God was doing in me and through me, you know, my family became Christians after I did. And when I began to kind of look back, sometimes I would have to look back to be encouraged to keep going forward to see God is moving in my life and through my life. And it's, it's exciting and it's worthy to pay attention to. I really enjoy digging, going deep, being deep, being in deep places, being in dark places. So that's where my story began, I think, to get a lot of traction. Let's, if we could, segue into you reading a story, because even as you're talking now, I, of course, have read the story and it's about you as a first grade girl. So is now an okay time to read it? Yeah, that's great. 
Tom, Betty, and Susan live in the little white house on Cherry Street with their playful dog, Flip. They are carefree and fun, and their parents usually end up laughing with them whenever something goes wrong. Susan is the youngest, the cutest, and the most vivacious, and I'm so happy to share her name. Each day at school, we come together in the half circle shape that is our reading group to discover their adventures. Being in the red group, the top group, makes me feel like I belong, and I'm eager to learn to read better each day. I am in Miss Patricia O'Day's first grade classroom at Clarendon Elementary School in the Twin Peaks neighborhood of San Francisco. Miss O'Day is old and takes her job quite seriously, which to me makes her grumpy and too strict. Our classroom is orderly and there's no fooling around with Miss O'Day. I think she wants not only to teach her pupils to read and behave, but also to prepare us for success in the real world. As the granddaughter of immigrants, I already understand how important this is for my brothers and me. Education is our path forward, as it was for my parents, who are also both teachers. Each of my four grandparents are survivors of the Armenian Genocide, which means they escaped from Turkey or Armenia with their lives and came to America between 1912 and 1917, as the Turkish government was in the process of massacring Armenians. The good thing about being in Miss O'Day's class is that there is structure and she is committed to teaching us. The not so good thing is that school is serious and most of us are not very happy in her classroom. That, however, does not matter. How I feel about Miss O'Day is not the point. The point is that she, like all teachers and authorities, are to be obeyed and not questioned. My job is to be good and do well in school. Teachers are, in mid-century modern life, quickly becoming authoritative guides to assist developing not only our book learning skills, but also our personalities. Clarendon parents who want high achieving, healthy children won't be challenging them. My brothers and I each have one syllable names, Paul, Sue, Greg. We are 100% American, and this is a very important counterweight to our last name, Heratunian. 100% Armenian. It means resurrection. The name Grandpa chose right as the massacres began and everyone he knew was about to die. Hard to spell, awkward to pronounce. With these American names, we have every possibility of fitting in while being assured we never will. But we have to do more than just survive after all our grandmas and grandpas went through to get here. We are proud and we have to make them prouder. One day we will all go to good colleges. Paul will be a doctor, Greg a lawyer, and me, I will be a teacher. I'm the quiet, shy daughter between two smart and confident sons. This is how it is. I don't mind and I like being a girl. What I don't like are my dark brown, almost black, thick, bushy eyebrows. I'm nothing like Susan from my reader who is bubbly with bright golden hair. She's always doing something lively, carrying around her little toy rabbit bunny. I love reading, and despite Miss O'Day, or maybe because of her, I play school all the time. I love having my own chalkboard and felt board, and I set up my classroom to teach imaginary students in our basement. I also like wondering about the meaning of life, and I spend a lot of time playing in my room by myself and daydreaming. One day during reading, Miss O'Day, with her giant-sized version of our book on Cherry Street, asks a question of our red group. I raise my hand and she calls on me. After I carefully give her my answer, she speaks to me harshly. It seems uncharacteristically threatening, even for Miss O'Day. If you don't talk louder next time, she says, raising her voice at me, I am going to keep you after school. Then she repeats her question. Again, I raise my hand and she calls on me, looking at me sternly. I give her my answer a second time. Miss O'Day eyes me with anger, scolding me that she still can't hear me and orders me to go stand in the corner. I am stunned. I wipe my sweaty hands, now dripping wet on my clean red jumper. I'm horrified and can barely breathe. I've been sent to the corner. This is even worse than staying after school. 
ashamed, I wonder how will I ever explain this to my mother and father? What will they say? Will they also be angry with me? I feel frozen, but I will myself to rise slowly from my wooden seat with the metal legs, staring at my feet in my white bobby socks and polished corrective shoes, shoes I hate, once even called baby shoes by a friend. My own skinny legs, heavy, slowly but surely, taking me past my reading semicircle, past the bulletin board and the sink with the drinking fountain to the back corner where I stand quietly facing the angle where two walls meet. I remember nothing more. Thank you, Sue. So can we reflect on some parts of it together? Sure. Mm -hmm. At the beginning, well, you name the bind that this little girl is in because of her first and last name. The bind you're in is represented by your very American first name, Sue, and your very Armenian last name. Uh, and, and what you say is with these American names, we have every possibility of fitting in while being assured we never will. So can you put some more words to that madness? Because that's madness. I think in some ways it's also kind of a challenge. And I, I really haven't realized this as much until recently when I've been thinking about not just my own racial identity, but the racial identity of my Black brothers and sisters and other people of color. I was always trying to fit in, always trying to be that American, smart, popular. And, you know, my parents' generation, they, they tried to fit in. And then now it was our turn. And this idea that we're trying to fit in, but we also have this reality that is very obvious, like my face. Like I get asked where I'm from all the time. And even if you just looked at my last name now, Cunningham, it doesn't really tell the story of who I am. And yet I think I wanted that American Anglo type last name more than anything because I also wanted to fit in. So it's just this, it, it's a very paradoxical, mysterious interaction between the two that I've been kind of fighting and challenged by my whole life. As a first grader, nobody is a better American comparison than this girl, Susan. How are you different than Susan? And what's it like comparing yourself as a first grader to this very American, Susan? Yeah, I mean, in one sense, it was like so validating because I'm also called Susan. So depending on sort of where I am, my family or school or, and at that time I probably was called Susan. So great to have the same name as someone in the reader, you know, that was really special. Now I would probably be more envious of her. Like I wish I was blonde. I wished I had blue eyes. I wish that I was like, everything was just such a lighthearted experience. You say in your story that what you don't like are your dark brown, almost black, thick, bushy eyebrows. So as a first grader, there is already contempt for some part of your body. Mm -hmm. And it shows up in comparison to Susan, uh, the other Susan. What was it like for you to be aware of these bodily differences at such a young age? You know, I think it's a combination of being aware and, and trying not to be aware at the same time. At that time, I, I might have been young enough that I don't know that I was thinking about my eyebrows just then, but it wouldn't be long. And, you know, I've been at war with my eyebrows my entire life. Very often in our stories, our insecurities are linked to parts of our body. And for you, it was uh, a part of your body that proclaimed your ethnicity and that showed that you were not like a blonde haired, blue eyed American white girl. You were other than that. And in America, that came to be something that put you at war uh, with, with, your, with your eyebrows. How has that war evolved 
over time? I mean, to be at war with your face is a really, it's a really profound thing. The other thing though, I will say, again, there's so much paradox in my, in my life because I'm also stopped all the time and told that I look like someone that someone else knows. And so there's this sense of like, you don't look like anything that is popular and good. On the other hand, I look like all these people. And there were times that I just, I'd go back and I'd look up the people because I'm like, what do they look like? Let's take a look at this first grader raising her hand. You're, you're having your reading time in your reading group with Miss O'Day. And she asks a question and you are a somewhat quiet, shy girl. Fair. Mm -hmm. But in your story, in this day, on this day, you raised your hand. Was that typical for you to raise your hand? I kind of think it, it was probable. You know, I think like I was a good student. I wanted to be good in school. I think I felt pretty confident in my reading. Although I wasn't talkative in the sense of I wasn't loud. I wasn't like a cut up or anything like that. But I think in that context, I would have participated. And so she calls on you and you give her your answer. And she is very uh, upset that you are not projecting with enough volume. And she says, if you don't talk louder next time, I'm going to keep you after school. And then she repeated her question again. And in your story, you raised your hand. And when I read that, I'm like, huh, like this is surprising to me. I do not expect you to raise your hand at that moment. Help me understand what is going on. Well, I'm surprised too. You don't have a lot of memories. And so when I think about that one, I think about, I wonder who I was that I raised my hand again. Right. And part of me is like, why did you do that? Like, you know, she was basically saying this criticism and had nothing to do with what I actually even said. I don't know. I mean, I obviously thought I had the right answer. And so I raised my hand again. And I think I just thought, well, I probably did try and talk louder. I mean, it's almost unthinkable that you didn't talk louder. What we know about Miss O'Day is she's strict. She's a strict, serious teacher. And she has just gotten upset with you. And you're a first grade girl. And you are somewhat shy. And there's no way that didn't register in your mind as like a major note of caution. Mm-hmm. That's a, that's a good word. Yeah. And so that thought that I just like raised my hand again. I'm like, I'm going to do this again. And yeah. You like her, don't you? I do. I was like, well, good for you. Like I, and she surprised me too, because she doesn't, I don't seem like someone who is uncertain and insecure. I seem like I have something to say and I would like to say it and I plan to say it. And even though your body at this point is in a different kind of state of, of regulation, probably less regulated, because she's just gotten mad at you publicly, you're in first grade, there is a measure of humiliation that you're already feeling in your body. And you raise your hand anyway. It's rather stunning. How have you come to understand that girl who does not go away in your story? The girl who raised her hand a second time. I mean, mm -hmm. that's just my guess. She doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. How have you come to understand that part of you? Well, I think that for a long time, I've always read the story more with Miss O'Day, the focus on her. Like, I'm surprised she called on me again. So that's the way I've always read it, that I can't believe she called on me again. And then when, you know, the more work I've done and thought about my young self, the more to think, no, you raised your hand again. And I've, I've been really wanting to understand that part of myself better to think like when I have something that I want to say, I will say it. And, you know, my voice, I have, I wanted to say it and I want to be heard. There is a part of me that, that does and has always wanted to be heard. And I think she shows up, you know, in this reading group 
and I, I take a note from her. She has a trauma response. She can't breathe. When, when Miss O'Day tells her the verdict, which is you're going to go stand in the corner, young lady, uh, her hands are sweaty. Her breath is different. There's something in you that's frozen. Mm-hmm. What was it like, Sue? What, what did it feel like? Well, part of it is like, I don't know. Right. All I know is that happened, and I think I just went offline. Mm-hmm. I got myself to the corner. I have no idea if I was in the corner for one minute or 10 minutes or an hour, like if there was recess, like I'm sure it wasn't probably that long, but I don't know. I don't remember. I don't remember even that day, any of my friends or like, I just, I don't remember anything. But what you do remember is the wooden seat that you were sitting on and the metal legs. Mm -hmm. And you remember walking past your semicircle reading group, walking past that bulletin board, walking past the sink, and that's what trauma does. Mm. We remember details, mm. even as we don't remember the rest of the day. Did you tell your parents? I think I told my mom uh -huh. at bedtime. And I think I must have told her with some caution, like, I'm going to tell you something. And this is what I did often, actually. To her. I said, I have something to tell you. If I tell you, will you promise not to get mad at me? Hmm. And so I think there was this sense of, I can't bear this. I can't hold it. Hmm. Because I think even at that young age, what I always thought was, like, this is ridiculous. Like, this is not right. This is unjust. But I don't know, because of the power of the school teacher and the school and, and in my family, and I don't know if I'm going to be heard and taken, be championed in this. And so I kind of with this thing like, I want to tell you, but I don't know how you're going to receive. You have remembered this story and you have said that this story has just a profound influence on you and meaning for you and for the rest of your life. And some would say, you know, okay, it's a, it, it's a bad experience, you know, but you have remembered this and it has immense meaning for you. C can you put some more words to like, why Sue? Why? Yeah. I, in part because a lot of times people have have asked me to speak up. Like I don't have a loud voice. And so a lot of times people can't hear me. So I have been at war with my voice too. You know, I've been complicit in mumbling, not talking loud, you know, not talking very loud. There is something that has just been kind of, I am trying to find my voice. And it took me till, you know, a very long time, probably the last maybe even 15 or 20 years to really feel like I'm coming in. I still feel like I am still coming into my voice. You know, my willingness to speak, my willingness to say my opinion, my willingness to, yeah, be heard. What do you imagine, and you may just know, happened in your heart in the aftermath of this story? Whether it's sitting, standing in the corner on your bed that night, the, the next day when you walk into our classroom, I mean, what happens inside the heart of this first grade girl as a result of this experience? I think two things happen at the same time. There's a like a great insecurity and a great, like, I don't think I'm going to be understood. I don't think that I'm going to be taken into account. But also there's a bit of protest that says, I will be taken into account and I will be understood. <laughs> And that is such a paradox that you hold in your body and that I imagine has played out over and over and over again. This paradox of I'm not going to be heard and understood. I'm too quiet. I'm not going to be taken seriously. And the protest of the girl who is saying, damn it, you will hear me. I have something to say. I think that's why I became a poet. Because um, that's what poets do. They give, give words and meaning to very small, 
events and they make them big and they make them seem. And poets tell the truth. They tell the truth in a way that exposes, in a way that prose often can't expose and can't proclaim truth. And I think that's what I love about it because it comes in, you know, slant, as Emily Dickinson would say, or it comes in the back door. How has your posture towards this girl changed over the years? Mm, I, you know, at times I've been so angry with her. Like, why did you, like, come on, like, why did you raise your hand? Like, could you not have told that this was like not going to go well? And then more recently to be like, well, good for you. Like you raised your hand, you had something to say, you didn't let her intimidate you and good for you. And I learned something from her that day, which is your voice has power. In this story, it's like the power of the powerless. Mm -hmm. But I have thought about this story probably every week of my life. So, you know, this idea that my voice is something to be taken into account and to develop. And this is where I do think that God has been opening up avenues for me to speak and be heard and listen and yeah, unfold, keep unfolding. It needs to be said that very often evil assaults our voice. Yeah, I think that normally what I would wish is that this story never happened. Hmm. I wish that this didn't happen. And that's often the way I feel when, when bad things happen to me or when evil attacks me. I wish it didn't happen. But with this story, the beauty of God's redemption and coming is that this story has made me think about my voice almost every single day of my life. And so therefore, I've had to contend with, will I speak up? Why will I not speak up? What's getting in the way of me speaking up? How am I, like, what do I have to say? And often to say, I actually have something to say, and it's actually important and needs to be said as we all do, we all have something to say. Now, in a really strange way, I'm really grateful that this happened because I would not be thinking about my voice. I bet you we'd not, we would not be sitting here talking about my voice and the struggle, but also the glory of it. You know, because people tell me all the time, and this is, this is kind of an interesting thing about my voice. People will say, oh, I remember what you said to me. I remember what you said to me. And a lot of times when I talk with people, after I say it, it, I go offline. I don't remember it. So whenever someone says, oh, I remember what you said, I always get a little bit like, what did, what did I say? But then when I, they tell me sometimes what I say, I'm like, oh, all right. That was good. That was pretty good. One of the things I hear you saying is that very often our stories of trauma actually reveal a lot about our glory and they can become our tutors and our guides in getting to know who we really are. And there's something about that that is incredibly annoying to me. And there's something about <laughs> that that's stunning. Um, and God is very much in that reversal. Yes. And such has been the case for that for you with regard to this first grade girl who who would not be silenced it's a beautiful invitation you know to think that um because i was sent to the corner for not talking loud enough i have been invited to talk louder for the rest of my life yeah and that's just that that's just delightful i mean just delightful to see how god does that um and again it's both annoying and it invokes uh, worship for me. And there's a sense of awe at not just the first grade girl, but there's a sense in awe, of awe at how God has kept this story so close to your heart in a way that invites you to be more you and to be more provocative with your voice. Would this be a good time to read the poem that goes that goes with it? Yes, yes, please. The juice of my tongue. In trouble with Miss O'Day for not talking loud enough. It was a question of taste, I thought. Imagine my surprise this afternoon 
when I picked up what she was trying to say, I was the wrong kind of Susan without yellow hair, zesty laughter, or a dog named Flip on Cherry Street. If I was going to flourish, live up to the red group, the high group, she would punish me until I became less shy, buried less deeply, less heart shaped as a granddaughter of fresh immigrants. My job to be a cheerful child, blossom in reading and the comprehension of all wild and acidic stories in my genes, surviving in the United States of personality. This body with damp hands, bobby socks and white corrective shoes, side parted nearly black hair with a cherry red barrette matching my jumper, my reading group and the blood of my people. I was sent to the corner when sour American teachers distinguished themselves that way so I could learn something about bitterness, the tang of my own brilliance, and whether I'm going to flower here. I thought it was a slip of my tongue, but it was the juicy secret of whispered fruit surrounding a pit I have carried from the motherland inside my whole contemplative life. Thank you. The poem, oftentimes poems need to just sit without commentary. Mm. So I just want to let that sit. Thank you. Thank you for reading it. Thank you for coming on the podcast, Sue. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. It's been an honor. Thanks, everyone, for listening. If you want to find out more about Sue or contact her, you can go to susan-cunningham.com, susan-cunningham.com. And remember, if you want to get episodes as soon as they are released, you need to head over to my website and click Get the App. It only costs $3 a month, and you will be helping to make the podcast possible. Thanks so much for considering it, and have a great couple of weeks.